welcome to, this will be the first, we hope, of many gatherings of this type to support the movement to address the mental health crisis. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce myself. My name is Lori Butterworth. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Chief Executive Officer at AIM Youth Mental Health. And it is not just a job, most importantly, it's a calling. And I mean that in terms of a dedication to something that is so important. I believe that mental health is the social justice issue of our time. And if we don't address it, we are going to have a ripple effect that will be devastating. Because it, the time is now. And AIM is dedicated to a couple of important things, and I'm gonna share that with you. One is to bridge the gap between research and access to care for children, teens, and young adults. That means like taking all that we know that happens in the lab, what we know in terms of what are the best treatments to address specific conditions and getting those out into clinics, into areas of underserved populations where people do not have access not only to uh, health care, but also in, in addition, lack of access to mental health care. That's one of our key benchmarks, our, our, our missions at AIM, that first part. And the second part is to empower teens, I'm sorry, children, teens, and young adults, empower them to discover their own mental health solutions because it's a personal journey, right? And that's the piece of our mission that we're doing here today, discovering our own mental health solutions, our own path towards healing. Because we know, how many of you have been on an airplane, what, is this, what does the flight attendant tell you to do first before you, what do they say? You put your mask on first, you do your own, in, you, your own healing and then you can support others, right? And then the other thing we do is we, and this is another piece of today, we empower caring adults. We train caring adults with skills and knowledge to address and support and identify youth mental health challenges. So I wanna encourage you, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and after this you can maybe um, sign up to become a youth mental health first aider. So you know how you take first aid, right? First aid, you have CPR, and in order to like be a teacher, a coach, or anything, you have to take CPR training. But now we offer youth mental health first aid training. That gives you the skills to know what to do, what to say, how to approach, how to listen to a youth non-judgmentally to support them, and how to help them off, uh, access care. Access that mental health care that I'm talking about that is specifically designed to help that child or teen with, their, with, with what they're struggling. So you can be that bridge. You can be part of bridging that gap. So there's, you can go on our website, aimymh.org, learn more, sign up for to become a mental health first aider. It's all on Zoom, so it doesn't even matter where you are. And it's, you get a certificate. You, know, you get certified. You become certified mental health first aider for youth. So if you have questions or concerns or or we want to talk, there are people from AIM. You see people with AIM t-shirts on, you know, um, and we can, we can have a conversation with you. So I want to um, take a moment, though, to thank the people who made this possible. Our main AIM expert, wonderful um, instigator of good is, is, is Sydney Stillwell. Can we give Sydney a round of, yeah! Great, okay, we are ready to get started. Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for being the difference. Okay, Sydney, there you go. Thank you, Lori. Um, yes, and thank you, Youth Advisory Board, and Paula here, who has been super helpful in planning this day. Um, and I'm going to introduce our first panel. It will be moderated by Rachel, who's on our board. Um, 
Rachel graduated from Princeton, where she spent most of her time as student body president, working on institutional mental health reform. She also helped lead the Ivy League Mental Health Conference in 2018. After graduation, she helped launch a venture capital-based fund in Philadelphia. She is actively angel investing in early stage mental health tech companies, and currently Rachel is the head of operations at Polymorphic polymorphic startup helping local governments digitalize how they work. Um, and then she'll be joined by Jessica Stone, Dr. Marvin Belzer, Belzer and Dr. Matthew Goodman. Um, and Jessica lives in Southern California as a mother, has a deep love of the ocean, and loves exploring energetic, energetic that ex energy, the energetic that, <laughs> that exists beyond what our visual eyes can see, sorry. Um, she is an author, teacher, and Harvard certified in psychedelic assisted therapies. She has been channeling soul guides since she was 12, traveling the world, leading retreats, speaking at universities, and working for Fortune 500 executives and celebrities. Marv, he's at UCLA. He's, um, he's taught mindfulness and meditation for 20 years. He is an adjunct associate professor in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. And for many years, he has taught a semester-long meditation course in the Department of Philosophy at Bowling Green State University. And Matt, he is at USC and at the Keck School of Medicine. He is a licensed clinical psychologist and clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and the behavioral sciences at Keck. He is the founder and CEO of The Middle Way, which is a consulting company aimed at enhancing individual and collective well-being through workshops, classes, and media. He has also taught mindfulness for 10 plus years. Welcome, <laughs> and here we go. And Jessica will start with the meditation for everyone. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Jessica. Thank you for being here. So obviously our panel is on meditation. Um, I'm sure everybody in here has said to somebody else, I should start meditating whether you have or not. And um, I think it's an intimidating place I think we have an expectation. And so I'm going to be leading a meditation today that, um, you know, just as I do, I usually like to channel. So I was standing over there and thinking, you know, we're here for mental wellness. We're here for each other. We're here to hopefully make a mark on this earth that um, does good. So um, I think I want to start this meditation because we are in kind of a busy place and there'll be people coming in and out. Um, this isn't probably the time and space to drop in and lay here for a good hour. So I'm going to start this meditation um, and I think the theme is going to be seeing all sides of like everyone in here, seeing all sides of ourself. I think one thing with um, mental wellness is uh, feeling lonely, feeling lonely in the human experience. It's very lonely to be a human, yet we are all having the exact same experience. We all have highs, we all have lows. Um, they come out in different ways, but um, we are all together in that. So I'm gonna start this meditation with actually you all. Um, we're gonna be going, we're doing this on the fly. Um, we're gonna be going zigzag, and I'm gonna have everybody just say, what, um, through the words you can best describe what sensation you're feeling and you do not have to share and also if you just feel like sharing your name, if that feels comfortable, anything is comfortable. And what we're doing is just basically before we actually begin the energetic meditation is honoring that this collective is probably the exact same of everything going inside me right now, these guys, our lovely moderator, and inside yourself and that place of um, really comprehending and understanding how close we are during this lonely human experience. So I'm gonna have you begin, whatever word. Cruising. And we're gonna go, we're gonna, like that wave, we're gonna wave. Relax. Curious. I was also gonna say relax. Arise. Motivated? Present. Grateful. Intrigued. Grateful. Curious. Relaxed. 
So everyone just close their eyes and take a deep breath into all those words you just heard. Really filling up the lungs and then breathing everything out. And collectively arriving here together in this space individuals yet as one and just give gratitude into yourself gratitude into every single person here and just take one more deep breath and release all the air out of the lungs and just sink into your body right now whether your legs are crossed uncrossed we're not trying to achieve anything right now. We're just simply being. We're meditating in a microcosm of the life of meditation. Just feel how your legs are, your stomach, your shoulders, your neck. Feel down through the hands, energy running out, even the fingertips. Feel yourself beyond where the fingertips end. You're alive your energy in motion. Bring that awareness up to the face, relaxing it and all the way to the top of the head. And even in doing that little exercise, if you feel the need to adjust yourself, if you're holding back, holding any walls up, guarding yourself, you can relax further into this moment. And we're just gonna do a gentle meditation starting at the root chakra, at the base of the spine, the base of the pelvis. It's a deep red earth energy. And just start expanding it, spinning it like a bicycle wheel, even if you're using your imagination. Our imagination is a brilliant tool. Just expand it to about 18 inches outside the body, the electromagnetic field. Releasing anything not grounding you today, or perhaps grounding yourself further down into your chair, down into the earth. Bring your awareness up to the sacral, below the belly button, that orange light, expanding it to the 18 inches. Allowing your physical body to filter anything that has you second guessing, your own creative expression to this earth and just let it go. Moving up to the solar plexus, a couple inches below the mid rib cage, expanding that yellow light. And right now, start to feel the feeling beyond the senses of everyone in this room. And then go beyond that and start to feel maybe thousands of places your energy is connected to right, to, right now. Maybe it was a conversation this morning, a thought that's still sitting in your body that totally didn't align with you, a to-do list in the future, or maybe a pattern completely from the past. And just one by one, start disconnecting those cords, allowing for 100% of your energy to be in this moment. Even if maybe random places come through that you're detaching from, just allow it. 100% of you here. So wherever that energy takes you during this panel, this day together, you're present and you feel it deeply. Bring your awareness up to your heart chakra, expanding that green light. And just feel the love that radiates from inside you, outward. We are complicated, but we are grounded in love. And just take a deep breath back into that love space, the truth of it all. Bring your awareness up to your throat chakra, that blue light expanding it at the throat. Letting any time your words didn't exactly match that sensation running through your whole body just to let go. Letting every word you speak flow from your whole being. 
Bring your awareness up to the third eye between the brow, expanding that indigo light. And just for a moment, notice your thoughts. Be with them. Don't try to silence them. And just watch them pass by as one leaves and another comes. That is the beauty of the human experience. And then I want you to notice the observer, the one watching those thoughts. And bring that awareness up to the top of the head, the crown chakra, of that white bright light. And I want you just expanding that awareness, letting it fountain down over the forehead, the cheeks, the chin, the shoulders, down through the arms, up the fingertips, over the chest, the torso, down through the belly, the hips, down through the legs, and out the bottoms of the feet. And just take a deep breath into the sensation. And breathing out. And at your own pace, not from when your brain tells you to, but from when you know it. You can start wiggling the fingers, the toes, blinking the eyes, coming back here together. And I'm going to have us close this meditation still in this container, this place of being individuals, but yet honoring everybody's experience together. And I want you just to turn to, if you don't know them, it would be better, but we don't need to get wild here. So just turn to somebody next to you and give them a smile. And thank you all. And that is meditation, whether you kept your eyes open, wiggled, or just totally left the planet and now you're questioning your existence. Um, so thank you all for letting me be here. And I'm going to pass it over to these wonderful people. I'll keep my mic. Um, Justin, thank you so much, Jess. Can we give her another round of applause? I will have to say, my word was going to be frenetic, and now I just feel alive. So thank you so much. Oh, I love that. Um, thank you, Marv and Matt, for joining us here today as well. Um, we will be having a very nice discussion about meditation. And first question, which will be very simple, is if you had only two minutes to explain the basics of mindfulness and meditation, what would you say? Marv, do you want to kick us off? Yeah. Hi, everyone. That was pretty good. <laughs> Two minutes now, I'm wasting time. The concept of meditation is like the concept of a sport. There are lots of different sports, so there are lots of different approaches to meditation. And um, I'm primarily familiar with mindfulness meditation, <clears throat> which I like to break into two parts, and a lot of it was covered in, in that meditation. The first would be we use our ability to focus our attention. And we do it in a way that's very doable and kind of surprising because we ask ourselves to focus on things that are kind of boring, so to speak. So if I ask you to look at my hand, and if you can see, OK, then Please look at my hand. <laughs> you can do it, right? This is how easy it is to meditate. We focus our attention on something real, something happening, uh, and there are dozens of ways to do it. Um, this is where you get different types of meditation, but most forms begin using this ability to focus our attention. And it is doable. We don't have to come to events like this and then someday hope that we can learn enough to start, right? The way that Jessica guided us, you know, just we were, she was inviting us to pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. And it's something we can practice. 
And uh, I love that point when we got to thoughts and you said something like, don't try to control them or don't try to get rid of them. That's my biggest pet peeve. Maybe not my big, but it is the idea that in order to meditate properly, we have to clear our minds somehow. Because a lot of people come to my classes anyway, thinking that you know they tried to meditate, but they couldn't clear their mind, so therefore they can't really do it. No, just as you can focus your attention, your visual attention on my hand, without clearing your mind, we can do the same thing with the breath, with ambient sounds, and so forth. And in teaching mindfulness, kind of the connection with our bodies, again, the way Jessica guided us is so fundamental. The second part is, uh, for mindfulness, is even though it is doable, this activity of focusing attention, our intelligence will kick in. And before we know it, we're daydreaming, planning, worrying, and so forth. And even though and the same thing would happen if we were using my hand. We're not, we wouldn't use my hand. But I, feeling the breath, it's like we really can do it. And it's, it, we don't have to feel everything. We, you know, just kind of, it's that mental activity, focusing, sustaining attention, which is the catalyst for calmness, clarity, stability. And when we realize the attention has drifted, we include whatever it is and without condition. Right? There's not a list of what it's approved to meditate on. Just fear, anger, hatred, physical pain. We include it, just feeling it, just knowing it's there with emotions, trying to feel them in our bodies. And then anytime we want and anytime we can, reconnecting back to that more neutral home base of the breath or where we we're trying to focus. That was great. Um, Matt, same question to you. Sure, sure. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'm so grateful to be part of this panel. Um, I'm going to highlight a word that Marv said, and that's attention. So if I were to explain mindfulness or meditation in a nutshell in two minutes, um, I'd really focus on that aspect of attention. And why is that? Kind of our theme for today is recognizing that we're all human beings. We're all connected in some way. And one of the things that makes us really human is that our mind loves to wander. It's, this is basically what it's made to do. And it serves a really good purpose. It has for us historically, evolutionarily, it helps to protect us. It helps us to plan for the future. So there's an important function to that, but when our mind wanders so much, this can cause a lot of suffering for us as human beings. And in the realm of mental health and psychology, if we look at different mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, one of the most important mechanisms underlying all of these things is attention. It's the ability to bring our mind back into the present moment. In the present moment, everything is normally pretty good, like all is well. Most of the time, everything that we're suffering from is happening from the experience that we're having about what's going to happen in the future, what happened in the past. And that's leading to a whole cascade of emotional responses, physiological responses inside of our body. And that's where stress and anxiety and then the wear and tear that the effects on our physical health, that's where that's taking place too. So all of that comes back to our ability just to be here in the moment, bring our attention back to what's happening, and that helps to regulate our emotions, to regulate our physiology, and that's why meditation is so important for our mental health and our physical health. Thank you. That was a really great explanation. Um, touching upon something we actually all did together, and I also want, Jess, if you have some words to say about this as well, um, we did some breath work together. Could we talk about what is the purpose and what are the benefits of doing breath work? Jess, do you want to start? I'll give you guys my, like, I'll give you whatever I give you. Okay. Um, 
Breath for me is the whole existence of life. Um, just as the days come and go, the sun rises and then the day ends, our lungs expand and they collapse. And um, the ebb and flow of life, we are on a high one day and then we're in a complete low. And sometimes this is simultaneous. Sometimes um, in a relationship, we are having the hardest time and in our work, we are a star. So breath for me is the essence of life it is um if you're ever not sure where you're at just come back to your breath and you will find the rhythm of all existence the ebb and flow and so um that is my non like scientific way of explaining it i'm sure you guys have actual like cool research <laughs> so i'm excited here i find your perspective on it way more interesting than my perspective, but I'll share from kind of the science-y part just to... Both are so important. <laughs> so when I think about breath work and the importance of breath work, um, I am thinking about what's happening inside of our nervous system. Um, so when we start to breathe really slowly or even if we're doing more kind of rapid, you know, breath work, at some point, we're helping to stimulate and turn on what's called the parasympathetic nervous system in the body. If people heard of this before, parasympathetic, yeah, so I see a lot of head nods. So this is the rest, digest, and heal part of our nervous system. And that branch of the body is a counterbalance to sympathetic, which is the fight or flight system. And as long as we're feeling anxious or stressed, as long as our mind is wandering, we can be stuck in that sympathetic fight or flight system. So we want to see if we can spend more time and tip ourselves back into parasympathetic rest and digest. The breathing exercises are such a nice, easy way to do that for us. So whether we're you know, sitting down, spending time, you know, 10 minutes, an hour a day practicing those, or we can train ourselves to breathe a little bit more slowly, a little bit more diaphragmatically throughout the day, we can hopefully start to just spend a little bit more time in the rest and digest part of our body and that can have some good health benefits for us. Um, my answer is more boring um, <laughs> in, the, in that in mindfulness practice, and this comes out of Buddhist traditions, my understanding is that um, the breath is often used as that home base for attention because it's available, sensations are there Right, in the abdomen, the chest, at the nose, we can feel something. We can know when the in-breath is beginning, typically. And the catalyst for concentration is this mental activity of focusing and sustaining attention on something relatively neutral. And those sensations tend to be neutral, not painful is the main thing. And this is not inconsistent with the other answers. It's just one kind in Buddhist psychology, the idea is that whether I focus on the breath or sensations in my hands or in standing walking meditation on my feet or use a mantra, a, a mental phrase, it's the mental activity of focusing and sustaining attention for a while that, that is what makes it possible to calm down become more clear and so forth. And um, so it, it, that was relatively boring. No, no that was great. <laughs> but, and, and also it's like, the, it's not inconsistent, like in yoga using pranayama, breath work, and all of that, that's a different way of using the breath. Um, um, but for meditation, especially if we're gonna do it for a while, it can be a lot of work that we don't need to do to let the mind settle just by, it's almost too easy because we're used to much more complicated jobs, right? And so just knowing when the in-breath begins by virtue of some sensations, abdomen, chest, or nose, it's so damn doable, right? But our minds are used to so much more to do, so we start complicating it. And that's where the effort, that's mainly where the effort comes in, is just remembering this is enough, but staying with it in that gentle, just enough way. And then there's that space for, them, for the mind to calm down. Uh. 
Um, I want to touch upon something both of you talked about briefly earlier, um, but as someone who was recently diagnosed with ADHD as an adult, um, my mind is constantly bouncing around and it's very, very hard for me to concentrate. Like a meditation in this setting was awesome because, you know, the energy in this room was very easy for me to just concentrate, but on my own, I find it very difficult to um, meditate in the more traditional sense of just sitting there and letting your mind calm and, or focus. So um, could we talk about some non-traditional ways of meditating? Um, open to all three of you, but are there ways of like moving while meditating? Could you talk about some of these alternatives? Um, so I think this is a really important question, especially for the reasons that we're all here, which is we're interested in the mental health of children and adolescents. Um, and when we're trying to teach meditation to children and adolescents, this can be especially challenging because it's really hard to sit still for 10 minutes, let alone two minutes or one minute. So how do we introduce these practices to youth who have a difficult time sitting still or just anyone who's struggling with something like ADHD? Um, so your meditation practice doesn't necessarily have to be a sitting mindfulness practice. You don't have to be sitting down and watching the breath. I'm sure people are familiar with this and you probably have your own mindfulness practices in different forms, but this can be in the form of yoga, moving meditation. We can practice meditation while we're walking. I personally love to practice when I'm walking like in nature. So just opening our eyes and our ears to the things around us, listening to sounds. This can be really grounding for kids. And oftentimes if we're struggling with ADHD or something like trauma, we actually don't really want to start our meditation practice sitting. It can be overwhelming for folks to close the eyes and to go inward. So anything that we can do outward, any place or any process that we can engage in where we bring the attention outside of ourselves to what's happening. You can even be sitting in practice of mindfulness exercise just right here, right now, looking around the room, listening to the sounds, feel my feet on the floor, so we're actually not having our attention inward or on the breath, but anything external that's happening. And then of course, all the other kind of informal ways to practice mindfulness while we're taking a shower, brushing our teeth, having a conversation with someone is I think the most difficult meditation practice, just to truly listen and not plan what I wanna say next or think about how is this person thinking about me and all the things that go through our anxious minds and we're having a conversation with someone. So any way where we can bring our attention back to the present moment over and over um, is a great mindfulness practice, I think. That's awesome. Does anybody else want to add anything? That was, that was a really good answer. Like this morning, um, obviously, like this is what I do pretty much every day. I meditate every day, but this morning, and I was telling these guys, I, uh, I make bread. And that was my meditation. I consciously knew that was my meditation. Um, when I don't feel like sitting and I need to move, um, I did bread. The kids this morning, I made them water the plants. Um, that's a meditation. They don't know it. Um, I don't ever try to have them sit down and meditate unless they invite themselves in. Um, you know, we all hopefully, if we're in this area, have access to the beach um, for children or any of us. If you just walk by the beach, usually the ocean can get us in kind of a rhythmic pattern to where... Um, to where it will help you. So that's another good kind of easy option when you get bored of sitting. And it's okay to get bored of sitting. And I always say like, don't stop then, switch it up. Um, you know, just don't stop the practice. So I get bored, so I bake or I cook or water plants, you know, so whatever, whatever it is. So just um, not making it look like anything. Um, I would say it's what I could add. Also, I know we've been using both the words mindfulness and meditation. Um, could you talk about the differences between the two? Mindf <clears throat> mindfulness is a capacity that we have. We don't have to create it, it's available. It's the ability to be aware of what's happening in our experience right now, what we hear, see, taste, and think, and so forth. And it's a capacity that can be developed and refined. And this is where you know, meditation comes in, but also these other daily life orientations. 
Um, and so um, there is a form of meditation called mindfulness meditation, which is what I know most about, but there are many other forms of meditation also. And so um, that's how I would make that distinction. Awesome. And also in this world where we're bombarded by so many like social medias and literally devices all around, like how do you maintain and how do you unplug besides like simply just leaving your devices um, off or not around you? Like how do you maintain an aura of mindfulness and meditation um, when we're constantly bombarded by so many stimuli? I'm just going to say that's too hard. Of course, <laughs> very much looking forward to the answers. I, I love social media. I'm a fan of it. Um, I'm in it just as like anything else. And we're like, oh, we love, you know, when we love like wearing cool clothes and all of a sudden like I'm going to wear sweats for like four weeks straight. Um, I'm in it when I'm in it. And then when I feel that intuition and we all have intuition to get off it, drop it. Anybody can wait 24 or 48 hours. It usually doesn't take that long, but to honor that sensation of when you've had enough with anything, the boundaries, the, um, you know, the consent of, um, I think social media comes in at us and takes away that consent, but we have the option in that. And, um, you know, my biggest walk away was, I think like seven months where I just bounced and nothing ever happens, even in my business where it's so social media based, nothing ever happens that and I'm not giving people career advice in case your whole existence is social media. Something might bad happen. <laughs> but, um, you know, does that make sense? It's like um, you are in control of this story and we all have the individual power to create the pace. And it doesn't matter what your pace is, but if you're doing your pace, then that is self-expression in the finest. So um, with social media, and I mean, I guess a quick one is I never, um, an hour before bedtime, that might be something I heard like blue light, black light, red something. Um, I read it on Instagram, uh, so I don't do that. Um, it's hard to do. Yeah, so just that hour before because I read it on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll just second what both Marv and Jessica said. First of all, it's just hard. It's just that's the reality of it. Um, and you know what Jessica said about setting boundaries, obviously, and making sure that you schedule time to not be on there. The other technique or thing that I would recommend is that if you are going to do it, I see if you can also do it mindfully. Like it's, it's possible to be on there with a state of awareness. And even when you're feeling that like dopamine urge to open your phone and scroll over to Instagram, do it. Like you don't necessarily have to resist it, but do it really mindfully, like just really slowly, like, okay, I'm going over to Instagram right now, I'm pressing the button, and notice all the feelings and the sensations that come up in your body. There's some really cool research on people who are trying to quit smoking, and just really quickly, they divided them into two groups, and one of the groups, they you know, used normal techniques, like, just don't smoke, you know it's bad for you, um, try to resist smoking. The other group, they said, okay, you can smoke cigarettes, but do it really mindfully. So each time you take a puff of the cigarette, really notice the smell, the taste, how it makes you feel. The second group had more success in quitting because they were present for their experience and they made it, it made them recognize how they felt. So can we be mindful of how it feels when I'm on Instagram for like a half hour or an hour and how I feel afterwards when I get off of it? If we can really get in touch with that, then that might actually help us learn from our experience versus kind of just shutting down and then, you know, having that whole cycle of shame and guilt that comes after that. We can even show up to that, those feelings that come up and that might motivate us to change our behavior in some way. That is actually very helpful tactical advice. I mean, I am definitely someone who has watched TikToks until the sun comes up, which is very embarrassing. But um, I definitely. That's the best of us. Oh, no, I don't know. I'm like, I, I feel the impulse to like stop. But I'm like, no, I can just keep going. And I'm definitely not mindful. So this is very, very helpful. Um, actually, Matt, you wrote an article about heart rate variability and why it matters for your mental health and well being. Um, can you explain what heart rate va variability is and ways we can improve on a day to day basis? Have people heard of heart rate variability or HRV? No, some yeses and some noes. Um, I know it's like a hot thing right now with 
the Aura Ring and our Apple Watches and everything, but um, I guess I can explain a little bit about what it is and why it matters for mental health, you said? Yeah. 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 Um, so heart rate variability, it's, it's a little bit different than our normal heart rate, but basically it's a measurement of how much variation there is in our heart rate throughout the day. And it basically tells us, A, like how well is this person able to adapt to their life, adapt to all the changing things that are happening around them. We want our heart rate to be able to go up, we want it to be able to go down. So it's a measure of that, but it's also correlated with mental health and physical health. So people who have you know, anxiety, depression, any sort of mental illness tend to have lower heart rate variability. And same thing for, for people who have chronic physical health conditions. So we want to see if we can raise heart rate variability, and there's a number of ways to do that. Exercise, diet, getting good sleep, those are probably first and foremost the basic things. But we also know that mindfulness meditation can increase heart rate variability and doing breath work as well. Um, so sitting, slowing your breath down, breathing diaphragmatically. And I think also really cool and on point for today is when we're in a group of people and there's some sort of coherence, some sort of collective coherence, that can also raise our heart rate variability. And in fact, our heart rates can actually become more and more in sync with each other. So just by being here today, we're all actually helping to work on our HRV and that has positive health effects for us. That is really cool to understand the science of behind what we're doing with Jess. So thank you so much for that. Um, we only have two more questions. So um, the uh, second to last question is, is there anything else you'd want this crowd to know um, about your research or your practice? Um, yeah, very open question. But if we could maybe start with Jess and then go all the way back down here. Um, I don't know if there's anything. I think what if you were to have a takeaway from this, it's, um, you know, and maybe we can even say it like the three of us we just met before and we were just chatting and, um, you know, there's these labels that we hold and then we're three people just chatting. Um, so I guess a takeaway from it is like, I know I could sit with each and every one of you and be absolutely blown away by who you are. And so to, one, thank you for being here, but to really just drop into that space of your individuality and, you know, as far as meditation, um, finding your individual groove with it and finding your individual pattern with what works for you. And um, that's all. Yeah, I like that answer too. I, I think, insofar as I teach college students well, it's because I start by having no idea whether they should meditate, right? While at the same time, having so much love for meditation and a lot of confidence that it can be done, and there are ways to learn it and practice it, and that it can have significant effects. So that combination makes for a kind of a wild, there, there are a lot of ways to get points. Um, and, and so it is such a personal activity. And um, we have to use, even with children, I, I don't teach children much, but even with children, they definitely can do these things, but they have to use their own wisdom right then and there also. It's not like they wait till later to get that wisdom, just in terms of the willingness to pay attention to our experience right, in the, in the moment, and uh, uh, <clears throat> it definitely can be done, but it's such a personal process, we want to really respect that and not take someone else's agenda. So finding that balance, right, and a few minutes a day can be important and enough. So don't buy some idea that you have to do it X amount of time, no even taking a few minutes away from social media, even a few minutes, it's not a small thing. Even one breath is not a small thing. And so we can begin to, to kind of make that connection. I don't know if there's anything I would add about kind of research or anything like that, but I guess just to kind of you know end or close the question part by saying that, I know we're all here for different reasons, but similar reasons. And um, 
we never know what's going on with other people and our experiences are all unique, but we all know what it feels like to be human and we all know what it feels like to suffer. And that's a thing that connects all of us. Um, and there's a quote that I really love from Ram Das, spiritual teacher, that we're all just walking each other home. And I think that's helpful to keep in mind um, and helpful when we're supporting each other. So we can show up to each other, support in different ways, whether it's through our meditation practices or just by listening to each other. But just given the theme for today, I think that's helpful to keep in mind. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we have one final question before Jess closes us out. Um, and that is, what is the integration of mindfulness in psychedelic use? Kind of a hot question, but feel free to answer however you'd like. Um, yeah, sorry, that was a mouthful. What is the integration of mindfulness and psychedelic use? Uh, I think we are, um, as we, um, I think it's very important. I think it's so highly, highly important. I hope it gets the honor and respect as our society, especially our Western society, perhaps moves into that. Um, and um, my biggest thing, and that would be, you guys can have a psychedelic experience in a hug. You can have a psychedelic experience um, looking at somebody in the eyes right now. You can have a psychedelic experience, um, you know, being mindful, picking up your phone. So realize you have all that magic and that wisdom inside you. So to, um, you know, practice it on our baby scale, because I think us as a society are at a um, infancy with, uh, and I say infancy because I think we're so wise at the same time, so. But, um, so yeah, just to, um, that's all I have to say. I'm gonna stop there, because then I'm just rambling. I love that. <laughs> so I know that's on the agenda for this, for this gathering. And um, I came here very resolved just to stay in my lane and teach what I know, but I knew it would come up. Uh, so briefly, you know, I uh, started meditating in the 80s when I was a philosophy grad student after having had some psychedelic experiences that were basically good. And um, one of my motivations for looking into meditation was the question, are there meditation methods that can have similar effects and that are legal and so forth? <laughs> and, and I would say the answer is yes, based on my experience. But that experience is doing long, intensive, silent retreats, including with Buddhist monks in Asia and in Myanmar, Burma, and, uh, and so forth. So there are differing levels of investigation that uh, <clears throat> uh, there's so much to explore. And I would echo everything that Jessica just said. It's really important to, to uh, um, kind of know our intentions and to have uh, read the right context for exploration and support. And, uh, and probably, this is my opinion based on my experience, a meditation practice as a foundation would, would be a good idea. Awesome. Would you like to add anything? No, you're good. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much. And Joss is going to close us out with, right? So do we have time for Joss to take us through the ending? Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah. We Let's like close it since we all started together. Um, let's all close our eyes. And um, we're not going to announce it to everybody, but after closing your eyes, um, let's just take a deep breath in. Filling up the lungs and just breathing everything out. And with your eyes closed, just maybe to yourself, find what word you're at now. And how quickly we can move into an altered state, how quickly we can move into an altered universe sitting in the exact same seat we began in with a completely different feeling and completely different mindset. And thank you all for being here. And um, it, it means so, so much that AIM is having us here. So thank you, thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Marv. Thank you, Matt. And I'll turn it back to Sydney.